Hey everyone, it's Jim and Charles from Vowels and More, an online vintage tube store. And today in Tube Lab number 124, we're going to talk about how to buy a tube amp, part two. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. Okay, so you're just about to finally have some extra cash, and you've always wanted a tube amp, and your idea of a great tube amp is one that is just filled full of vacuum tubes. Well, hold on just a minute, and I'll walk you through a logical process of choosing the right type of tube amp for your music, speakers, and budget. What did you just say, speakers? What in the heck do speakers have to do with the decision? Exclamation mark. Well, a lot. So in part one, we talked about narrowing down the choices based on the size of your listening space. And today we're going to look at the second most important thing in choosing your tube amp, the speakers. Okay, let's run through the options. Now, last week we had included the small room option. And for that, I really recommend that you go with a headphone amp and of course preferably I would recommend a tube headphone amp and we don't need to talk about that today because of course that would mean a headphone and we're talking speakers so when it comes to tube amps one real general rule applies and that's that they're much lower powered than a comparable solid state amp is going to be that's just a fact we have to live with it so once we know that, we can start to think a little bit more about what kind of speaker we can drive. And that means efficiency. We want efficient speakers. Yes, we can get higher power tube amps, but we're talking about significant money, especially if we want to go class A. But I'm getting ahead of myself now because that's going to be next time. So let's talk about speaker efficiency first off. And let's take some examples of real and sort of imaginary speakers so we can we can figure out where we're at. So first of all, speaker efficiency has one number and that's in decibels. You can look up how it's measured. We don't have enough time to go into testing procedures, but the basic rule is that the lower the number, the less efficient you're gonna be, and the higher the number, the more efficient you're going to be. So let's look at these examples. So here is a really well-reviewed um, ELAC large bookshelf, the 5.2 that um, I think it just came out this year or last year. And it is at the bottom of the examples I'm giving it. And it's about 86 dB efficient. Next, we've got the sound explosion. And this is like a tower of power from the past. <laughs> when I was growing up, a young audiophile, this, this was the, the source of, of, of wet dreams, let me tell you. This thing was as tall as, as I was, and it was filled with speakers, and you could put, you know, a thousand watts through it, and those speakers were inefficient. They would be roughly something like 87 dB. Okay, what about a really high-end speaker? The B&W 702, they are, are they 10 grand each or 10 grand a pair? I forget. I actually have sat down and listened to them. Um, you'll recognize these instantly. They've got that really weird looking shell sort of tail like thing of a tweeter mounted on top. And they sounded good, but I actually was listening to some crossover points that, mm, I don't know. I didn't, that didn't sound like a $10,000 speaker to me. I actually prefer the next speaker I'll show you in a minute. But these are 90 dB. So there's a modern tower, high quality build, that actually would be comparable in size and number of drivers to this monster that we had available in the 70s. And it's actually, you think, oh, 3 dB, that's nothing. Well, 3 dB is actually huge for speaker efficiency. 90 dB is not in the... Um, it's not a linear scale. It's not a linear scale. 
And 90 dB is not a high efficiency speaker, but it's not a, a medium or low efficiency speaker. So it's starting to get close to being a, a higher efficiency speaker. High efficiency speakers start at about 93 dB, and that is my custom open baffles. And um, it's the only speaker I've ever owned that I, I've never wanted to get rid of. <laughs> so, mind you, I, I built 12 prototypes of it, and I've modified it. Um, I've modified it a couple of times since I built it. So it's now running a 14-inch woofer in an H-frame and a 10-inch mid-range and a really beautiful um, waveguide-loaded tweeter. I think they're made by Scanspeak. I forget who made the tweeter. Anyways, now, if you have, if you're going to, if you're going to want to go Class A in a tube amp, and we're going to talk about that in detail in the next episode, but if you want to go with the pure Class A uh, power amp, and that's all we sell as kits, um, and we're going to talk about why and the sonics of a pure Class A, you want to be somewhere around 93 dB or more efficient. And what that'll do is if you have, let's say, an 830B amp, you'll be able to drive these speakers easily, so you've got lots of headroom, and you'll be able to get them loud, and they're going to sound amazing. If you took that same 8-watt amp and tried to drive these, you'd get sound. Or these, you get sound. Maybe better sound than this. Actually, <laughs> um, you'd get a lot better sound than this. But you're not going to have any room left in that amp. You're probably, if you want to turn the volume up a bit, you're not going to have the ability to handle the peaks of the music properly. And um, it won't take your amp long to clip. So, what I'm trying to say is, if you've got inefficient speakers now and you don't have a tube amp, you may want to think about what your speakers are going to be and get the speakers, get high quality speakers first and then go backwards towards the tube amp. The um, Paul over at PS Audio, who's one of my gurus, he, um, he has actually a, a daily uh, blog post that I read and, you know, sometimes it's just a... Uh, he just says, uh, I've just got my first harvest of tomatoes. Woohoo! <laughs> but most of the time it's audio related for audio files. And he says 75% of your budget should be spent on your speakers. And I think if you're, you know, like I am, I'm, I like to develop and build my own products. It doesn't need to be as high as 75%. But if you're going to buy everything brand new from manufacturers, it should be pretty close to 75%. So find something, let's say 90 dB and higher efficiency. As a, this would be a minimum, I would say, 90 dB, not the $10,000 speakers. I mean, if you can afford $10,000 speakers, more power to you. But there are great budget options that are above that nowadays, and they're getting more and more common. Yeah, it's amazing, actually. In the last two to three years, the high-quality speaker that people like... Um, Jones has put out, um, uh, have, have just, you know, you get a huge amount of quality sound for very little money these days. Whereas when I started out, um, oh, as an audiophile over 40 years ago, um, my friend had a high end system. His parents had it, but, you know, he was there choosing it and poking and prodding them, or they would never have bought spent that kind of money. He, he had a large infinity system, I think. And those speakers were, I mean, I would have loved to have hugged them if he would have let me. They sounded absolutely amazing. But in today's dollars, they would probably cost, you know, a, a year's wages for the average person. They were that expensive back then. Now, you know, if you're on a budget, you can shop used and get something really quite good. Okay, so... What's been going on over at Melatone Kits? Well, we've just sold out of our GU50 test builder kits. We just sold the last two. Yeah, uh, so they went off to a good customer 
And the test builders are really coming. They're, they're finishing up. But I actually had two left in the store. And he's, he grabbed them up, which meant he's going to be the last test builder. And, which, and he's going to be able to test some of the tweaks that we've learned from the other ones. So that's great. That's true. And he's as a result of, of being the last test builder, he's still going to get a bonus set of high-quality vintage tubes included as a gift. Mm -hmm. So it'll be interesting to see how he does. He's actually quite experienced building ham gear. So um, he won't have any... The kit's not hard to build. So Oh, it's pretty simple. So he's probably just going to fly right through it. Yeah, I... We've had even first timers build our kits. Now, a first timer is going to hit some problems, and we're going to have to talk them through it. Um, but at, at the end of the day, we, I don't think we've ever had a builder uh, not complete their kit. Right. So that's the important thing. And of course, you, you got to learn somehow. So after your first kit's built, um, you're home free. You could build pretty much anything we'll release in the future. Um, so that would be your training wheels. <laughs> Okay, so that's good. Well, what's going to happen now that we've sold out of the GU50s? Well, we're going to prepare a production run eventually. It's in the works. We have a lot of other stuff going on right now. And we're going to let you know on one of these weekly videos whenever we're getting close to it. And how many were we going to uh, probably make in that run? Probably 20. So 10, 10 pairs of monoblocks. And because the Kid Amp business is growing so much, we have to start subcontracting. So the plinths... We're hoping to work with a really nice woodworker, an older gentleman who's really, he's got, uh, I mean, I used to be a cabinet maker. I had a cabinet shop in my 30s, and I used to build fine furniture. And we looked through his portfolio, and this gentleman, he knows wood. So I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing. He's actually made us some, some prototypes. So we're going to see how they look and if we can come to terms. If we can, we'll have a subcontractor that can handle the plinths because I just don't have time to make them anymore. And we've got to find a subcontractor to make the top plates because, again... It's very time-consuming for us. Even though we picked up the CNC machine before for doing this kind of work, it is still very labor-intensive. Yeah, so that's the future for the GU50. It's going to be a while before we have those ready to release, but... Um, That'll be um, a fun day when they're in the store. When we can, we've never put twenty kits in the store in one product no, line. No, no. So, um, so stay tuned for that, and we'll give you a heads up whenever we're getting close to it. Okay. Well, what came in this week, Charles? Well, we got a couple of interesting tubes here, so let's clear the deck. Okay, I'll do that. All right. Let's get these out here. So let's start with this guy. This is probably pretty recognizable for most of you here. Uh, of course, this is an EL34, and this is an original Svetlana St. Petersburg production EL34. There's a few things that give it away. We've, we've talked about these on camera before plenty of times, but we've got these straight down metal spacers or tines here. I think they're sometimes called whiskers as well. We have the double top saucer getters and sort of the offset chroming you can see on both sides these these tubes are used but they have great chrome on them yeah and i think the getters are angled aren't they and so the chrome mm -hmm. chrome is angled as well and the the copies and new productions of this tube do not have these getters so this is a, a straight giveaway right here and we have this brown i think it's mycanol base and on all these Svetlana tubes, they always discolor like this after a little bit of usage. The, you see them start to get darker right away where they've been heating up. And that's because the L34 gets really hot. Oh, it's a toasty tube. Lots of power in a little package. If we compare that to something like a new production Svetlana, which of course was made by New Sensor. Yep. Yeah, in Russia. You can tell that they were trying for the same look here, but if we take a closer look, of course, we have a different getter ring. We don't have the two saucers. We have a single ring on two posts. The plates are different. These metal whisker tines are different. They're angled upwards and then down. And they've clearly tried to copy the base design, but because it's a more modern material, it doesn't discolor at all. So that's a giveaway right there. But they put the label on. They put the label on. So There's... That one, I don't know if you can see the original on here. It's pretty faded. Let me, there we go. 
Yeah, so you can see the Wing C right here, and this one is the more blocky Svetlana S. Yeah, and the the real tube can have either one of those labels, and they can be in silver, they can be in gold. Uh, they I think can we've be, seen them black too. We've seen the very old ones are in in a big bright black. Yeah, so you you can't trust the labels but you can trust the build and construction of it. So always pay attention to that if you're looking to buy the true vintage tubes and not the reproduction ones. So what else have you got? Well, this is gonna be something of interest for all of you uh, musicians out there or guitarists, but also maybe for some, uh, some people interested in hi-fi. We have a beautiful Philips box and inside of it, we have EL84s. So just like the EL34, this is a power tube, and just like the EL34, it was one that was developed by Philips. And realistically, it's roughly about a half-powered version of it with a 9-pin base. So while the EL34 is capable of, I think, a maximum of uh, 25 watts, this one is around 12. That's in Class A, though, right? That's in, in Class A. I think they class go 34 a. watts in Class AB, something like something that? Something like that. And so we just got in a bunch of beautiful new old stock examples. And these are, you can see the tube code right here. These are actually Mullard made. We've got the B for Blackburn and the seven. So that means it was probably made in 1967. And then the D and what so is the that? D is uh, April. Yeah. So that's the month of manufacture and the two is the week. So this is the second week of April of probably 1967 that this tube was made. So it's a beautiful new old stock example from back then. And we're going to have a bunch of matched pairs and possibly matched quads in the store. Yeah, I'm, I've already got them listed as singles. So if you want a pair, you just buy two. And if you want a quad, you buy four. Um, these are probably the hardest to find new old stock, new in the box, EL84s, and they are not cheap, unfortunately. I wish we could find cases of them so we could make the price more affordable. But it's an, and in all the years I've been in business, I've never found this many of them new in the box. No, no, it's fantastic. And, and so many vintage guitar amps and hi-fi gear and even some modern low-cost production amps that are coming out of China and other places use these tubes as power tubes because they're, they're great for efficiency in terms of the amount of watts for the size these are fantastic yeah so smaller integrated amplifiers um modern integrated amps will use them because you know the smaller the amp chassis the less the cost the smaller the hard the the iron the less the cost mm -hmm. but does that mean that the they're going to sound any less great no no they're, they're going to sound fantastic i mean it's a phillips produced power tube how could it not yeah yeah, made in Blackburn. That's gold. Okay, Charles, thanks for that. And if you stay till the very end, here's some discount codes to help you out. Remember, we've got flat rate shipping of $20 around the world. And if your order is $150 or more after discount, the shipping is on us, folks. And there's discount codes to help you out. There's one that's fairly easy to guess that's not on the list. And somebody got it this week. Cost us big money. <laughs> oh, we like to give it back, though. We like to give it back. So that's great. And there is a secret high, high spender code. You probably could figure out how much you have to spend to get that code. And nobody has ever gotten it, even people who have spent that much money. So, well, I, and actually, I'm kind of hoping they don't because that's going to hurt <laughs> big time. Okay, everyone, stay safe. Have fun. This is Jim and Charles signing off. Cheers, everyone.